This program is presented by Birch Gold Group, the precious metal IRA specialists. Good morning. Today's headlines after a tight race, Senator Raphael Warnock ekes out a projected win in Georgia. Hear what Warnock and Walker had to say after results came in. Soldiers hesitant to get a COVID vaccine just got an early Christmas present. A defense bill which would end the military vaccine mandate will be heading to Congress for a vote this week. Top FBI official has stepped down. This after a House committee asked for his testimony. They plan to investigate the Bureau of over political bias. A former FBI general counsel slow rolling the release of the Twitter files. Elon Musk says a top Twitter executive has been fired. And a video goes viral of a former CCP official's daughter publicly opposing lockdown measures, threatening to kill in self-defense. Good morning. Welcome to NTD. I'm Kevin Hogan. And I'm Evelyn Lee. Good morning. Today is Wednesday, December 7th. The results are in from Georgia. Democratic Senator Raphael Warnock is projected to win re-election. He defeated challenger Herschel Walker by a narrow margin. Walker conceded last night. Warnock came in with close to 51% of the vote. Walker had just over 49%. That's with 98% of the estimated vote counted. The win gives Democrats an outright majority in the Senate for the rest of President Biden's term. Warnock had this to say at his victory speech. Are you ready, Georgia? I'm ready. Stand up for workers. Stand up for women. To stand up for our children. I'm ready to build a stronger Georgia. God bless you. Keep the faith and keep looking up. Walker did not argue with the results. He thanked God and his supporters and says running for the U.S. Senate has been the best thing he's done in his life. There's no excuses in life. And I'm not going to make any excuses now because we put up one heck of a fight. I want you to believe in America and continue to believe in the Constitution and believe in our elected officials most of all. Continue to pray for them because all the prayers you've given me, I felt those prayers. This race was the most expensive one of the 2022 midterm season. In total, they spent more than $400 million. The runoff was held because neither candidate secured 50% of the vote in November's general election. Another surprise twist at Twitter, CEO Elon Musk confirmed that a top official, James Baker, was fired from the company yesterday. The former FBI general counsel was let go amid concerns about his possible role in suppression of information. And today's Daniel Monahan has the story. Musk wrote on Twitter, quote, in light of concerns about Baker's possible role in suppression of information important to the public dialogue, he was exited from Twitter today. Musk added that Baker was questioned before his firing about the events related to the Hunter Biden laptop suppression scandal and that his explanation was unconvincing. Musk was responding to an article penned by Jonathan Turley, a George Washington University law professor and political commentator. Turley noted that Baker was a former FBI general counsel. Baker played a key role in the Bureau's investigation into false claims of collusion between Russia and the 2016 presidential campaign of Donald Trump. Baker has not issued a public comment about his apparent departure from the social media firm. It came days after Musk provided internal Twitter information to journalist Matt Taibbi. Taibbi published details about the social media platform's decision to censor the New York Post's report about Hunter Biden's laptop in October 2020. And minutes after Musk confirmed Baker's departure on Tuesday, Taibbi wrote, on Friday, the first installment of the Twitter files was published here. We expected to publish more over the weekend. Many wondered why there was a delay. We can now tell you part of the reason why. On Tuesday, Twitter Deputy General Counsel and former FBI General Counsel Jim Baker was fired. Among the reasons? Vetting the first batch of Twitter files without knowledge of new management. The process for producing the Twitter files involved delivery to two journalists, Barry Weiss and me, via a lawyer close to new management. However, after the initial batch, things became complicated. Over the weekend, while we both dealt with obstacles to new searches, it was Barry Weiss who discovered that the person in charge of releasing the files was someone named Jim. 
When she called to ask Jim's last name, the answer came back, Jim Baker. Baker is a controversial figure. He has been something of a zealot of FBI controversies dating back to 2016, from the Steele dossier to the Alpha server mess. He resigned in 2018 after an investigation into leaks to the press. The news that Baker was reviewing the Twitter file surprised everyone involved, to say the least. New Twitter chief Elon Musk acted quickly to exit Baker Tuesday. Taibi says that reporters have resumed searches through the Twitter files material and that there is a lot of it. He added that the next installment of the Twitter files, quote, will appear. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. A top FBI official has stepped down. This as House Republicans announced plans to investigate the Bureau for their recent operations. And today's Jeremy Sandberg has the story. Stephen D'Antono, the assistant director in charge of the FBI Washington field office, announced his retirement on December 2nd. D'Antono says his decision was based on a desire to dedicate himself to his family. His retirement comes just weeks after Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee named him as one of nine FBI employees they would require prompt testimony from as they seek to investigate potential political bias at the Bureau. The committee wrote to FBI Director Christopher Wray in early November. They say despite making several requests over the past 21 months for information and documents regarding the FBI's operations and actions, they've been ignored or given no sufficient response. They warned to resort to compulsory processes if the requests are still outstanding when the new Congress convenes in January. The committee has requested testimony from at least 42 Biden administration officials so far. That includes employees in the Justice Department, Department of Education, Department of Homeland Security, and the White House. The House Oversight Committee has also announced plans to investigate President Biden and his alleged involvement in his son Hunter's foreign business deals. When asked about the timing of D'Antono's retirement, an FBI spokesperson gave a brief statement to the Epic Times via email, saying D'Antono chose to retire after nearly 27 years of service with the FBI. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. The end to the COVID-19 vaccine mandate for the U.S. military may be in sight. A defense bill that would end the requirement is heading for a vote this week in Congress. NTD's Daniel Monahan has the story. Republicans emboldened by their new House majority next year pushed the effort which was confirmed on the evening of December 6th when the bill was unveiled. The efforts to repeal the mandate were led by 13 Republican senators with Rand Paul at the helm. The COVID vaccine has a risk of causing inflammation, particularly in young men, particularly the young men that comprise over 90 percent of our military recruits. Paul, a doctor, says the heart inflammation caused by the vaccines can lead to death. Meanwhile, he says the young men and women in the military face little risk from COVID itself and that many members have already had it. That grants them a form of protection against reinfection and severe disease, which many studies have said is superior to the vaccine. Senator Ron Johnson criticized the logic of mandates for vaccines. He says don't stop transmission. The bottom line here is the vaccine does not prevent infection, it does not prevent transmission. So why would we make anybody take it? It is insane. Meanwhile, Senator Ted Cruz said he believes that vaccine mandate policies were pushed through by the Biden administration to purge conservatives from the military. Purge from the military people who don't agree with their political agenda. I think they're using it as an excuse from the enlisted level all the way up to the majors and colonels to the top brass. Senator Lindsey Graham said the mandate would have resulted in tens of thousands of able-bodied Americans who are well-trained leaving the military because they chose not to get vaccinated. At the same time, we've had millions of people coming to the country legally without vaccination that are being sent by our own government all over the country. Representative Mike Rogers of Alabama said the removal of the vaccine requirement was essential for the defense policy bill to move forward. He pointed to serious recruitment and retention problems across all services. He added that the pandemic was over and that it is time to recognize that and remove the unnecessary policy. The bill, which sets how a nearly $850 billion Defense Department budget will be allocated in fiscal 2023, is tentatively scheduled to be voted on by the House on Thursday. The legislation mandates that the Pentagon repeal the vaccine mandate within 30 days of becoming law. Daniel Monahan, NTD News. 
Billionaire George Soros was the biggest political donor this past midterm election, spending $129 million on Democratic candidates. But how much has he spent on media organizations around the globe? A new study looks at just that. A watchdog organization called the Media Research Center recently released part one of their three-part research on George Soros' influence on global media. The study finds that Soros has used his charities, including the Open Society Foundations, to finance at least 253 media organizations around the world. The founder of the Media Research Center, Brent Bozell, spoke about the findings on Fox News on Monday. Everywhere you look, you know, when you look at the Pointer Institute, the big fact checker, mm -hmm. it's funded by George Soros. How many people know that when you go on Google and you look up something, immediately you get Wikipedia, funded by George Soros? The media organizations include Project Syndicate, a publisher of commentaries that has received over $1.5 million, the Pointer Institute's International Fact Checking Network, which has received almost $500,000, and National Public Radio, which has received $600,000. Bozell says he believes Soros is a dangerous man. Here's his comment on Soros' ultimate goal. George Soros was asked that question, and his answer, you know, what, what do you want? His answer to me is, chilling. It chills me to the bone. His answer was, I want to change the arc of history. That's how ambitious this man is. The Media Research Center says it will release parts two and three of its research later. They will detail exactly how much money Soros has spent on media organizations and which corporate media received Soros's money. And now over to China. We've been covering how the Chinese regime forcibly takes people from their homes to quarantine camps, even if they tested negative for COVID. And now a video of a former Communist Party official's daughter opposing these acts went viral among Chinese netizens yesterday. The video shows Liu Xiaoqin, the oldest daughter of a CCP general, picking up kitchen knives from the table. She warned the officials that if they enforce the law violently and do things that are inhuman and devoid of conscience, they will be greeted with a kitchen knife. Liu is the daughter of a general who once served as China's Minister of Public Security and Vice Premier of the State Council. This video is currently blocked on Weibo. <laughs> If they want to kill my cat, if they want to drag me to the camps, I firmly tell you, the Constitution grants me the right that if you want to use violence, I have the right to self-defense. I am 75 years old, and I'm not afraid of death. You're law-breaking thugs. You can come to me. If I die, I will take you with me. Anyone who violates the law, breaks into homes, and violently enforces the law, you will be greeted with kitchen knives. I will chop you one by one. And what's interesting here for context is back when residen a residential community was locked down, authorities would go into homes and spray everything with, with disinfectant, even throw away food in the refrigerator, and pets like cats and dogs were beaten to death. That's why the lady was trying to defend herself and her pets. Oh yes, and now the white paper movement from the college students is pushing back. The Chinese regime has announced a series of measures to ease its COVID, zero COVID policy, but we don't know how well the new policies will be followed. And coming up, the U.S. Secretaries of State and Defense met with their Australian counterparts in Washington. Countering China's aggression was at the core of the talks. And President Biden pays a visit to an Arizona nanochip plant. It's part of a large investment by a Taiwanese company creating new jobs in the region. That and more in just a moment here on NTD Good Morning. Shen Yun Creations. The streaming platform from Shen Yun, featuring world-class dance, past programs, and all original music. Masterclasses, behind the scenes, comedy, and more. Explore ShenYunCreations.com. This is Stephen K. Bannon. I urge you to protect your savings from inflation by diversifying into a physical gold IRA from Birch Gold Group. Simply text the word NTD to 989898 and you'll get a free info kit on gold IRAs explaining everything. You're not going to get it all right. 
but just make sure you nail the big stuff. Mama! Like making sure your kids are in the right seat for their age and size. Get it right at NHTSA.gov slash the right seat. Good to have you back. The U.S. Secretaries of State and Defense met with their Australian counterparts in Washington yesterday. The focus of the meeting was an increased U.S. military presence in the Indo-Pacific amid increasing aggression by China in the region. Entities Cost Temenes has this report. The U.S. will boost its military presence in the Indo-Pacific region. That's according to U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken. We're increasingly weaving together our alliances in Europe and Asia, in the Atlantic, and across the Pacific, because the challenges and threats that those alliances face are increasingly interconnected. He was accompanied by U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin at a meeting with Australian Foreign Minister Penelope Wong and Australian Defense Minister Richard Marles. We'll also expand our logistics and sustainment cooperation, and that will deepen our interoperability and create more agile and re resilient capabilities. We'll also continue to find ways to further integrate our defense industrial bases in the years ahead. Blinken also spoke about challenges posed by China to the international rules-based order, including attempts to disrupt the freedom of navigation in the South China Sea. The group also discussed the progress of the security partnership between the U.S., Australia and the U.K. Our three countries have made significant strides toward Australia obtaining nuclear-powered submarines while adhering to the highest non-proliferation standards. Australia's defense minister said it's a huge step that America is taking. It will transform Australia's strategic posture. It will increase our capability dramatically. Um, and we are deeply grateful for the work that we've been able to do with the United States in developing that. Miles said he and Foreign Minister Penny Wong would invite Japan to participate in more exercises with Australia and the United States in upcoming talks with Japan in Tokyo. What we want is a region that is stable, prosperous and respectful of sovereignty. Frequent military collaborations between the US and Australia have already been going on in Australia's Northern Territory, with thousands of US Marines rotating through the territory annually for training and joint exercises. Last month's meeting between Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Chinese leader Xi Jinping at the G20 was a step towards normalizing ties. But Australian diplomats say it won't change Canberra's defense policy. Cost MNS, NTD News. Republican lawmakers are warning of a threat to national security posed by a Chinese state-controlled shipping platform. They say the digital logistics system could provide the Chinese Communist Party with sensitive U.S. government and military data. Beijing is offering the platform to freight carriers, ports, and foreign nations free of charge. They call it a one-stop shop for data management and tracking shipments. It's subsidized by China's Ministry of Transport. Over 20 global ports are using the platform already. Senator Tom Cotton and Representative Michelle Steele called it a disaster for American interests in a letter to President Biden. They worry the CCP could exploit it to identify early trends in the movement of U.S. military supplies and equipment, while at the same time denying other countries the same data on Chinese military assets. Over 25 congressional GOP members joined the letter. They urged Biden to take action to stop the spread of the system. President Biden yesterday visited a Phoenix plant being completed by the Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, or TSMC. The project was previously announced by President Trump in 2020. The company announced a $40 billion investment in Arizona. With plans to build a second plant in the pipeline, officials say the two plants, coupled with new factories by Intel, Micron and Wolfspeed and others, could give a decisive edge to the American military and economy, especially at a time when comp competition with China is heating up. The event was attended by Republican Arizona Governor Doug Ducey and his newly elected Democratic successor, Katie Hobbs, Arizona's current Secretary of State. Also attending were Apple CEO Tim Cook, TSMC founder Morris Chang, Micron CEO Sanjay Marotra, and NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang. TSMC had made a $12 billion investment here in Phoenix to build the first fab to make semiconductors in the United States. Now the equipment is ready to move in. 
Next year, commercial operations are going to begin. And today, TSMC has announced a second major investment. We'll construct a second fab here in Phoenix to build chips, the three nano chips, the three nano chip, chips that are three nano, and you know what I'm saying. <laughs> nano no no, I don't know. But look, these are the most advanced semiconductor chips on the planet. Biden expects jobs will come to those regions. Although it's a slow process, they may not materialize for a decade or more. The Labor Department says it could also be challenging for companies to find educated workers for jobs with incomes averaging over $100,000 a year. Thousands of military history fans are recreating Napoleon's famous 1805 battle, the Battle of Austerlitz. The event commemorates the battle that made France into the dominant power in Europe. Entity's Flinders Kingsley has the story. Military aficionados from 15 different countries gathered in Austerlitz in the Czech Republic. With thousands of participants, the drama is so big it could be a set for a movie. Initially it was a challenge for me to be able to organize this and make it happen. Now we are the biggest event of this kind in Europe that lasts this long. There is nothing like it. The armies arrive and set their camps up just as soldiers would have done over 200 years ago. People from all over the globe come to participate in the Battle of the Three Emperors. We participate because we enjoy performing this act for people and we fight for the Austrian artillery. The reenactment tries to follow the story faithfully. Napoleon's men were outnumbered. The French with 72,000 and the Russian-Austrian alliance had around 85,000 soldiers. During the battle, the Austrians and Russians launched their main attack. 10,000 French fended off 40,000 Russian-Austrian soldiers and then repulsed a second assault before Napoleon launched a counterattack. It is interesting that people from across the world, now it is 15 countries, US, Canada, Europe, can arrange this, agree on the script of this act, gather here, sleep somewhere on the ground and create this friendly reunion for this historical event. Napoleon launched 20,000 men into the Russian-Austrian occupied zone, the Pratsen Plateau, a zone Napoleon previously evacuated to try to trap the Allies, a trick that won him the battle. This is not a glorification of Napoleon at all. It is remembering an event that has shaped Europe for many years. The Russian-Austrian allies lost 15,000 and had 11,000 captured. Napoleon lost 9,000 men. For reenactors, it is not about being on the winning side. Our unit represents Russian artillery, specifically the artillery company of Major Stjaden. We have a cannon replica and I always attend because this is an excellent group of people. Four days after the battle, Austria signed a truce and later in the month signed a peace treaty that would see France as the dominating power of Europe. Flinders Kingsley, NTD News. Coming up, the World Cup quarterfinal matches are now set. We hear from Morocco fans excited about their team's advancement. That and more on NTD News. A performance that truly matters for each and every one of us. This is what you've been waiting for. See it at least once in your lifetime. Get tickets now at ShenYun.com. Communism is evil. Oh, come on. Listen, if you're as tired of the censorship as I am, I've actually got good news for you. Check out EpicTV.com. It's a brand new censorship-free video platform where you can find not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great programs, and honest movies that bring you the news without all the spin and the fake narratives. So, I'll see you there. Welcome back, I'm Evelyn Lee. Morocco becomes the first Arab team to enter the quarterfinals of the FIFA Soccer World Cup. The achievement comes off the back of a victory against Spain. Entity Flinders Kingsley has more. Hey, boy, 
Morocco beat Spain 3-0 in an overtime shootout after a nil-all draw. Moroccans around the world are celebrating. All Moroccans are happy. To be honest, we played a great game and we had a strong competition, but we defeated them. Thank you, Bonu. He played great. A conflict between Moroccan fans and police broke out in Belgium after young fans fired fireworks toward the officers. It's a first for an Arabic-speaking country to make the quarterfinals at the first World Cup held in an Arab country. The locals are in full support of Morocco. Today I am very happy and Arabic people are very happy also because the Morocco today win. I hope inshallah Morocco to be in final. Inshallah. I hope that. Morocco will be going up against Portugal, who took down Switzerland 6-1, despite captain and lead goal scorer Cristiano Ronaldo spending most of the time on the bench. I think it was kind of good because the team was more unpredictable and they could get more goals. But Ronaldo should always come to a match. Portugal fans understand that Qatari fans will be supporting Morocco. A lot of people are supporting them. We are like Arab world supporting them, so it's going to be tough. But um, yeah, yeah, if we play our A, a game, I think we, we can do it. The game will be held Saturday, December 10 at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. Flinders Kingsley, NTD News. Scientists are tracking lava flows from Hawaii's Mauna Loa volcano. The lava flow is now less than two miles from nearby roads. The Mauna Loa eruption has reached its second week on the island of Hawaii. The speed of the lava slows as it moves into flatter areas. Currently, it's moving at about 22 yards an hour. There are no signs of it stopping as great amounts continue to fill the upper lava channel. Since the beginning of the eruption, the island has now registered three fissures contributing to the lava flow. Geologists monitoring the flow are also using infrared cameras that show the location and temperature of the lava. Authorities have asked people not to hike onto the lava, saying it's not safe and it puts other people in danger. Hmm, infrared cameras, that's pretty cool. Yeah, and you know, they're now using new cloud technology that can even use a mobile app in their helicopter to track the eruption. That's helpful, considering it's so close to the critical highway now. I oh, think yeah. Less than just two miles, right? Yeah, and now the National Guard has been dispatched, too. So mm -hmm. even though residents are flocking to see it and tourists, too. Well, I would love to see it. Yeah, me too. Glow? Amazing. <laughs> yeah, good view. Absolutely. Um, that's all for today's program. Let us know if you want to see it. Write us at goodmorning at ntd.com. Thanks for watching. I'm Evelyn Lee. And I'm Kevin Hogan. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.